We're in Jeremiah chapter 42 this morning. I'm going to read the first six verses and then we'll pray and we'll dig out God's word together today. So Jeremiah 42, starting at verse 1, says, Then all the army officers, including Yohanan, son of Kareah, and Yezaniah, son of Hashiah, and all the people from the least to the greatest approached Jeremiah the prophet and said to him, Please hear our petition and pray to the Lord your God for this entire remnant. Circle that word remnant in your Bibles. For as you now see, though we were once many, now only a few are left. Pray that the Lord your God will tell us where we should go and what we should do. I have heard you, replied Jeremiah the prophet. I will certainly pray to the Lord your God as you have requested. I will tell you everything the Lord says and will keep nothing back from you. And then they said to Jeremiah, may the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act in accordance with everything the Lord your God sends you to tell us. Excuse me. I just get choked up when I read this stuff. <clears throat> Whether it is favorable or unfavorable, we will obey the Lord our God to whom we are sending you so that it will go well with us, for we will obey the Lord our God. Let's pray while I get a drink of water. Father, thank you for this time we can share together from your word. We pray that you would use this chapter of Jeremiah to minister to our hearts, Lord, however we might need it, whether to be challenged or whether to be encouraged today, that you would just do your good work by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving us so much that you would send your son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. We commit this time to you, Lord. We want to be open to what you would have to say to us. So speak to us now. We, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here freely. For those who are watching online, we just commit all this to you, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified as we study your word together and that you would use it in our lives and in our hearts today. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So if you were with us last week, you will remember that our study last week from chapter 39, as we just make our way straight through the Bible here, we're going through the book of Jeremiah on Sundays. From chapter 39, we reached a very pivotal point in the story of um, the people of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, uh, the people to whom Jeremiah is ministering. And that had to do with the tragic fulfillment of the prophecy that Jeremiah had been speaking against his own people, the Jewish people, that if they didn't turn from their wicked ways, if they didn't renounce their idolatry and turn back to the Lord, that God would allow the Babylonians to come and to besiege Judah, and in particular the city of Jerusalem, and it would be the demise of their own capital city. Last week's study detailed that. In 586 BC, the Babylonians come, they besieged the city of Jerusalem, and the bitter fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy occurs. Uh, the city of Jerusalem is ransacked. The temple of Jerusalem is destroyed. The articles within the temple are taken by the Babylonians back to Babylon. And at the same time, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon takes thousands of Jews captive and he deports them the roughly 1,000 miles from Jerusalem to Babylon where they will spend the next 70 years. All of this could have been avoidable if the people had turned back to the Lord, but they refused to heed the words of the prophets. Uh, they refused to obey God, to honor God, and so they suffer their consequences as a result of their own sinful choices. And after thousands of Jews are deported to Babylon, by God's providence, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar allows a small group of Jews to remain in the land of Judah. And this small group is known as the remnant. It's the word I, act, I asked you to highlight or to circle in verse 2. It describes this small group of Jewish people who were allowed to remain in the land of Judah, who were not deported along with thousands of other Jews to Babylon and, and so, by God's providence, they remain here in the land, and again, they are known as the remnant. Jeremiah uses this word remnant ten times between chapters 40 and 44, and three of those times are found right here in chapter 42. 
We already saw one of them in verse 2. It's also repeated again in verse 15 and verse 19 further down in the chapter, which we will see in a moment. And this remnant of Jews that has remained in the land of Judah approaches Jeremiah with a prayer request. And their prayer request is, would you please pray to the Lord for us about what we should do, whether we should remain in the land of Judah that has been ravaged by the Babylonians and is now under the, the rule of the Babylonian Empire, or should we relocate and start our lives over in Egypt? And this is their request. Jeremiah, pray for us. What should we do? We're only a few now. Should we remain in the land or should we go to Egypt? Pray for us. And Jeremiah says, okay, I'll pray for you. And the people respond by saying, whatever the Lord tells you, and you come back and tell us, we're going to do it. Whether it's favorable or unfavorable, we're going to obey the word of the Lord. Just tell us. Oh, famous last words. <laughs> and so Jeremiah goes up. He says, okay, I'll pray for you. And it takes 10 days before the Lord responds to him. By the way, a little reminder that every time you pray, you may not get the answer by the evening, right? Sometimes we want answers quickly. Sometimes they don't come quickly, but they're always according to God's perfect timetable. 10 days isn't that long, actually. Some people have been praying here for 10 years about something, and, and God's delay is always for his display. Sometimes it's slow according to our timetable, but it's always on time with God. And Jeremiah goes away and he prays on behalf of the remnant that's left there in Judah. And 10 days later, the Lord gives him an answer. Pick up the story with me still here in chapter 42, verse 7. It says, 10 days later, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. So he called together Yohanan, son of Kareah, and all the army officers who were with him, and all the people from the least to the greatest. And he said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your petition, says. And then he quotes the Lord. If you stay in this land, I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and not uproot you, for I am grieved over the disaster I have inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you now fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord, for I am with you and will save you and deliver you from his hands. I will show you compassion so that he will have compassion on you and restore you to your land. However, if you say, we will not stay in this land and so disobey the Lord your God, and if you say, no, we will go and live in Egypt, where we will not see war or hear the trumpet or be hungry for bread, then hear the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. There's that word again, remnant. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. If you are determined to go to Egypt and you do go to settle there, then the sword you fear will overtake you there, and the famine you dread will follow you into Egypt, and there you will die. Indeed, all who are determined to go to Egypt to settle there will die by the sword, famine, and plague. Not one of them will survive or escape the disaster I will bring on them. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. As my anger and wrath have been poured out on those who lived in Jerusalem, so will my wrath be poured out on you when you go to Egypt. You will be an object of cursing and horror, of condemnation and reproach. You will never see this place again. O remnant of Judah, the Lord has told you, do not go to Egypt. Be sure of this. I warn you today that you made a fatal mistake when you sent me, this is Jeremiah talking, when you sent me to the Lord your God and said, pray to the Lord our God for us. Tell us everything he says and we will do it. I have told you today, but you still have not obeyed the Lord your God in all that he sent me to tell you. So now be sure of this. You will die by the sword, famine, and plague in the place where you want to go to settle. Your attention for a moment. We get the idea from the last part of this chapter, what Jeremiah says, that God has revealed to Jeremiah the true intent of the heart of the remnant. And the true intent of the heart of the remnant was that all along they really wanted to go to Egypt. They had that in their hearts. We just want to get out of this place. We want to go to Egypt. But nevertheless, I don't know, maybe as a formality, they say to Jeremiah, why don't you pray for us so we can get God's will on whether we should stay or whether we should go. And by the way, we're going to do everything that the Lord tells us, whether it's favorable or unfavorable. Baloney! Because by the time Jeremiah tells them, here's the word of the Lord, he rebukes them basically in that last part and he judges them. He says, basically the sword and famine and plague are going to come upon you because I know what you're really wanting to do. Now, question, not a show of hands. Have you, ever, have you ever intended to do something, you already made up your mind you're going to do it, but you go ahead and pray anyway, hoping that God will give you the thumbs up? Okay, not a good thing to do. That's what's happening here. They already had it in their hearts, we're going to go to Egypt. But we're going to pray and ask Jeremiah if he'll pray for us anyway. 
you know, maybe God will be cool with this. All right, God wasn't cool with it. But it's a good reminder to us. Don't ask God to answer your prayer if you have no intention of doing what he says. And furthermore, none of us should ever ask to know the will of God about something if it's predicated upon our own will. And some of us are like that. Like, God, what is your will? I mean, I'm just curious because I'm going to do whatever I want to do. It's like, is it your will or is it God's will? Are you really praying because you want to know what God wants you to do? Or are you praying because you want his stamp of approval on what you've already decided to do? That's what's going on here in this story. And God says to the people of Judah through the prophet Jeremiah in response to their prayer request, I want you to stay right here where you are. I want you to stay right here in the land of Judah. I don't want you to go to Egypt. Do not go to Egypt. Don't go anywhere else. Stay right here in the land of Judah. He warns them, and his command is that they stay right where they are. Now, unfortunately, we find out in the next chapter, which I, I won't read, but I'm just going to summarize the events. Unfortunately, in the next chapter, we find out that they come unglued. And they accuse Jeremiah of lying to them. You're lying to us. God didn't say that. God didn't tell us to stay here. You're lying. We're going to go to Egypt. And Jeremiah's like, you asked me to pray, I prayed. Oi vey, you know, whatever you want me to do. Like I prayed and I, you know, I, I prayed and I prayed for you and I come back here and all you're telling me is you think I'm lying. I'm not lying. This is what God says. They're like, well, we're going to Egypt anyway. And off they go. Suffice it to say, it doesn't turn out well for this bunch. Okay. So we have to be careful when we pray. When we seek the Lord's will, are we really willing to do what he tells us to do? Well, that's not the focus of today's study per se. The focus of today's study is on why God wanted the remnant to remain. And it's also about why God always wants a remnant to remain in places that need his representation. This is not just an historical story. This has modern application as well and future implications. So let's start with a working definition, a biblical working definition. I know everybody knows what a remnant is in general, but a biblical definition of the word remnant, when you see that word used in the Bible, it's basically a small group of the Lord's faithful followers who represent him in a larger setting. Now, the question again, why did God insist that the remnant remain in Judah? So it's now, it's now a, a place that's been ravaged by the Babylonians. The, the temple has been destroyed. The city of Jerusalem is rubble. Uh, thousands of people have been taken captive to Babylon. It's, it's now a ghost town, Jerusalem. And there are very few that are left. So, you know, it's no wonder, we understand from just a human perspective why they would want to go somewhere else that, you know, might be uh, better conditions um, and have food and, and not feel the terror of the Babylonians living now under their domination there in Jerusalem. Um, but this remnant is told to remain. Why are they told to remain? Primarily because God wanted to make a statement that Judah will rise from the ashes. You see, he wanted the remnant to remain right where they were because it was a statement that God had not forsaken or forgotten either the land or his people. And that once again, the land would be fruitful. And once again, the people would return to this land. And so he wanted the remnant to remain as sort of like a, de a, a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So I want you group of people to remain here. You are a remnant that represents me and, and that reminds people that I am a God faithful to my promises and I will make this land fruitful again and I will restore the people because God had told them in advance of the discipline of the Babylonians. God had told them in advance, you're going to spend 70 years in Babylon, but I'm going to bring you back. And he wanted the remnant to remain as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come as a representation of God's righteousness in the land that God had not forsaken the land or forsaken the people, that the land again would be fruitful and the people once again would return to this place. And let me tell you why understanding the role of the remnant is so important for us today. Because friends, we are that remnant in the world today. The church is that remnant 
in the world today. We are to be a reminder of the faithfulness of God and the representation of the presence of God by reflecting His righteousness in the world. That's the duty and calling and privilege and responsibility of God's church. We are that remnant. And so it's important for us to understand the the modern application of this, the idea of a small group of people uh, in in a place that was barren, uh, in a place that had really little regard for God. Why did God want them to remain? So I've got four points I'd like to share for us to understand about the role of the remnant. And for those of you taking notes, here's the first point. The remnant is the minority. The remnant is, by definition, the remnant is a small group of people So it represents a minority of people. And notice again in chapter 42, verse 2, what we read earlier, when when the people approach Jeremiah and ask him to pray for them, they describe themselves there in verse 2 as the remnant. And that's when they say in verse 2, though we were once many, now only a few are left. So by definition, the remnant is always a minority. Now, let's, let's bring this home to modern application. How many people, what's the, what's the general population in the world today? What's, the, what's a, a general number? World population. It's, it's really actually seven now, 7.7 billion. 7.7 billion people. Some say 7.5, 7.7 billion people on the planet today. Now, of that 7.7 billion, how many identify as Christian? Now, that may not you know, mean the same to some people as to others, but basically people who check a box and say Christian religion. How many of the 7.7 billion people identify as Christian in the world today? 2.2 billion. 2.2 billion. Now, of those who identify as of the Christian religion, we, our particular church, would be a part of the stream known as evangelical Christianity. Evangelical Christianity, who believes that the Bible is true, the inspired and fallible Word of God, and that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Evangelical Christianity, of the world's population, 7.7 billion people, according to one source, uh, Operation World, the number who identify as evangelical Christians among the 2.2 billion who say they're Christian in name, 550 million. Now, I think that's a generous number, but let's just go with it for purposes of discussion. 550 million evangelical Christians among 7.7 billion people on the planet. We represent roughly 7% of the world's population. That's it. We are the minority. Okay, that means that 93% of the rest of the world's population do not share your values, your beliefs, or know what you know. And I don't mean that in a proud way, like, know what you know. I just mean in, in the sense of, like, if you know Christ as your Savior, others who don't share that, don't know that, we have our work cut out for us. We got 93% of the world's population who are not a part of evangelical Christianity. So they need Christ, and we have our work cut out for us. And as the remnant of the church, the remnant as the church, we have a responsibility to make sure that though we are few in number, we're a minority, relatively speaking, of the world's population, we have to make Christ known in our world. Now, if you use statistics of Americans alone, so let's not use world population, let's just use American uh, population. According to the Pew Research Center, the number of evangelical Christians in the United States represents about 25% of the American population. Now, I think that number is a little generous too, but let's just go with it for a moment. That still means that 75% of the American population does not believe what you believe, does not share your values, does not know about Christ, at least not in terms of a relationship. They might have a head knowledge, but they don't know him. So again, we have our work cut out for us. But let me tell you what this also means. It means in any given situation, whether at work, whether in some social setting here in the United States, when you step into a room, 75% of that room does not share your values. Now, unless you're, you're only hanging out with, with church people, okay, which I hope you're not only hanging out with church people because the rest of the world needs what we have, right? But basically, statistically speaking, in America, you step into a room, 75% of the people in that room are not going to share your values. The remnant is 
the minority. And again, we have our work cut out for us because they need Christ. They need to know what we know. We can't hold on to it. We have to be sharing it. We have to liberate people, understand what Jesus said is true. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And the truth is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we need to share Jesus so that people can know the freedom of having sins forgiven and lives radically changed and the hope of heaven in our hearts with a, with a full assurance of knowing what we, where we go when we die. Because we are to hold out the light of Christ and make him known in our world. We are that remnant to represent God's righteousness in the world. But we're a minority. The good news is, though, God doesn't need many. In fact, strictly speaking, God doesn't need any. Because God can do what He wants to do, all by Himself, perfectly fine. But God chooses to use the few, not the many, to accomplish His purposes in the earth. And the reason he chooses the few and not the many is so that no one would mistake the result for human ingenuity. God, when you look at Scripture, is always careful to just use one or two or a few to accomplish his purposes so that he would be most glorified so that people won't think that they accomplished it. I mean, you look biblically at different stories like God used one young shepherd boy to fell a giant and to defeat the whole Philistine army. Just one, because one with God is more than many without him. Amen. And God would use just a select few over different times of biblical history. Remember the army of Gideon in the book of Judges, numbered 32,000 at first. But the Midianites who were coming against the Israelites numbered as many as the sand on the seashore, the Bible says. Too many to count the army of the Midianites. 32,000 is not that many when you're outnumbered that, by that many people. Nevertheless, God said to Gideon, you got too many. 32,000 is too many. Whittle the number down until he got down to 300 faithful few. And God said, now you got the group down to a size that I can work with. And when the Israelites defeated the Midianites, nobody thought, wow, well, it was because of the power of the Israeli army. Everybody realized this is the doing of God. God took 12 disciples and turned the world upside down. God took one Savior to save it. So God is not into numbers. He's not into people being able to lay claim to the, uh, the idea that it was the size of the army or it was the multitude of people or it was the m uh, many skills. We are few. The remnant is a minority. But the strength of the remnant is not in numbers. The strength of the remnant is in the Lord. Amen. The strength of the, of the remnant is in the Lord. In Psalm 20, verse 7, David said, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Even in his day, people were putting trust in other sources besides the Lord. And it might feel sometimes like we're outnumbered. Because we are. But we're only outnumbered in terms of the population, not in terms of what God can do through a faithful few. We've got a massive world to reach for Jesus. Don't stop sharing about Christ just because some refuse to listen or believe. The work of the Holy Spirit is conversion. Your work is conversation. That's worth tweeting right there, I'm just telling you. Conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit. Conversation is your work. So you tell them about Jesus and you, you trust the results to the Lord. But don't stop sharing about Jesus just because some people refuse to listen or some people refuse to believe. And don't stop standing for what is right just because you're in the minority. Be the remnant that reflects Christ and his righteousness in the world. Number two, God is always with the remnant. Look here in this same chapter at verse 11. God wants to encourage the remnant with these words. In verse 11, he says, Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you now fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord, for I am with you and will save you and deliver you from his hands. And notice there just a number of references to fear. Don't be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord. The people of Judah, the remnant, was afraid of the king of Babylon because he was a force of opposition. And he was a powerful one at that. 
And the Lord wanted to assuage their fears and to calm their hearts with a reminder that he's more powerful than any earthly king and that he will never leave them nor forsake them. That God is with us. And why is this important to remember? Because don't be surprised in the course of representing Christ in your world that some people will not like you and some people will oppose you and some people will get downright hateful. Don't be surprised. And if you, if you say to yourself, well, I'm not really facing any opposition in my faith, then maybe it could be that you're too far up in the stands and you're not down in the game. Because in case you haven't noticed, there's increasing hostility in our world towards Christians and Christianity and biblical values. And it will only get worse. Because Jesus said in Matthew 10, 22, all men will hate you because of me. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Now that's not a verse that, you know, I, I put on my refrigerator with a magnet, right? Okay. That's not one of those verses. I, oh, great. Everybody's going to hate me for the sake of Christ. But we need to be aware of it. We need to be aware of it. For a long time, a Christian in America could blend into society without much distinction. That was when societal values and laws and social norms were more parallel to Christian values. No longer. No longer. The lines are not parallel. They have veered in opposite directions. I've never lived in such a time as the present with such cultural and sexual and mental confusion. A time when people not only expect you to embrace, but to celebrate what is abnormal and unhealthy and a complete denial of reality. And when you don't, when you don't embrace and celebrate those things, they will hate you. The opposition will rise up. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11 to 12, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This shouldn't surprise us, friends. This is the new norm. But just remember that when people may say things about you, and the haters may hate, and the people who oppose may oppose, just remember that your brothers and sisters around the world are enduring a whole lot worse. A whole lot worse. You look at some things happening as a result of Islamic terrorism in our world, you remember just a few years ago when some Islamic terrorists lined up 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians on the beach of Libya and beheaded them and then posted on social media? That's the kind of persecution that we need to remember is going on around the world. So the next time somebody says something or tweets something or posts on social media about how they don't like you, big deal, right? Big deal. Remember how Islamic terrorists blew up a Christian church in Pakistan on Easter Sunday a while ago, killing Pakistani Christians? That's persecution. So when somebody doesn't like you at the office, they post something about you on social media, big deal. Jesus said, blessed are you when people say all kinds of evil against you and insult you and persecute you. Great is your reward in heaven. This is this is frankly something we should expect going forward. And the truth of the matter is that persecution of Christians has existed ever since they nailed Jesus to a cross. I mean, Tertullian, the second century historian, once remarked, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And so, when God says here to the remnant in Judah, don't be afraid of the big bully, King Babylon, the king of Babylon, don't, don't be afraid for I am with you. We have to remember, God is always with us. Amen. And Paul would say in Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? 
And David would say in Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Points number three and four, the last two points I want to share from two other examples in Scripture. And point number three is going to be from the life of Noah. Because when you talk about a remnant in a day, Noah and his family were certainly a part of a remnant. And the Bible describes the condition of Noah's day like this. It was only evil all the time. And in Genesis 6 verse 5, it says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. But four verses later about Noah himself, the Bible says that Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. It is possible to live a righteous life in an unrighteous world. It is possible to live a blameless life in a blame-filled world. It is possible to walk with God when others may not. Noah did, and so can we. And our day is not too far removed from the day of Noah. In fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 would say that the conditions of the culture just prior to the second coming of Christ will be very similar to the conditions of the culture in Noah's day just prior to the flood. There's an extreme similarity, and I think we're living in this day. In fact, if not for the fact that God promised He would never again destroy the world with a flood, we are ripe for one. We are ripe for one. But God in His mercy said, I'll never destroy the world again by a cataclysmic flood. And so he puts a rainbow in the sky as a reminder of his faithfulness in that regard. And may I just say, the homosexual community may hijack the symbol of the rainbow for their cause, but the symbol of the rainbow was God saying, never again will I judge the world by way of a worldwide flood but it doesn't mean that never again will I judge the world. Judgment is still coming, and we must be the faithful part of the remnant to make him known and to shine in the universe. Genesis 7-1, the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. It's point number three. It's possible for the remnant to remain righteous in this generation. I don't care how young you are or how old you are, you can still live for the Lord despite what anyone else might say or how they might decide to live. You can still decide as Noah did to be a righteous man or a righteous woman in the world today to reflect Christ and His righteousness in our world. Finally, Point number four from the story of Elijah, real quickly, I'll summarize the events of the story of Elijah, who was a prophet of God sent to the people of Israel. His story is recorded in the book of 1 Kings. Elijah was sent as a prophet during the reign of King Ahab of Israel, who was a wicked king, along with his wife Jezebel, who was a wicked queen. The combination was double trouble. The Bible says that under the reign of King Ahab, idolatry in Israel had increased to an all high time and the worship of God was basically non-existent. So God sent the prophet Elijah, a remnant in his day, to address these false gods and these false prophets. And so Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal, that was the God of the Canaanites, and the prophets of Asherah, the female counterpart deity of the God of the Canaanites, to a showdown on Mount Carmel in Israel. It's one of the first places we go in our tour of Israel. And there on Mount Carmel, we have a Bible study when we go there. And in that location of Mount Carmel, Elijah challenges these false prophets. Let's see if your God will show up. And then after you give a good try at it, I'm going to see if my God will show up. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. And so this little showdown ensues. And the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah are chanting for their gods to show up on Mount Carmel and display their power. And they start, the Bible says, they start cutting themselves. It was just kind of an idolatrous custom, the cutting themselves and letting the blood flow. And they're crying out to these false gods. And, and Elijah's standing on the sideline and, he's, and he just, it's the first example in the Bible of trash talk. Elijah just starts trash talking. He's like, where's your God? How come your gods haven't shown up, guys? You know, what's the problem? Maybe your God's on vacation. Who knows? Maybe your God's not making this up. He says, maybe your God's sitting on the pot. He says that. He says, maybe your God's going to the bathroom. He's like, you know, he's tied up. He can't really come. And so he's trash talking them the whole time. And they're like, ah, they're cutting themselves even more. Nothing happens. 
And so then Elijah's like, okay, it's my turn, and I'm going to summarize the events. Basically, when it's his turn and he prays, God shows up in a powerful way, in a powerful way. And all these false prophets fall down on their face, and they're undone because they know they've been outdone by the true and living God. And those false prophets are hauled down to the valley, and they're killed. They're killed that day. And there's a great revival in Israel. But something happens with Elijah. What happens with Elijah is he, he literally comes down off the mountain. And some of you can understand this. If you've ever felt like you've been used by the Lord in some significant way, something happens sometimes where it's the enemy or whatever comes in. And then on the heels of some great thing where God used you, you can start to feel depressed. That's what happens with Elijah. He just spirals and depression sets in and, and, he's, and he's just all sullen and, and he prays to God. It's in 1 Kings chapter 19 and he says it twice in verse 10 and in verse 14. Elijah says, God, you know, I, I, I just feel depressed. He goes, I'm the only one in Israel. I'm the only righteous guy in all of Israel. And it's depressing. And God, God and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, God, God says, uh, no. You're not the only one, Elijah. Thank you very much for what you've done, but you're not the only one. He says, I have actually reserved 7,000 in Israel, you don't even know, who have never bowed their knee to Baal. You're not the only one, but you are one. I got 7,000 others. And I, I just want to make sure in, in summarizing all these things that when we speak about the church being a remnant in the world, I want to make sure everybody understands that I mean the church at large, capital C. I don't for a minute think or want you to think that we're the only church, we're the only ones who are exclusively living for the Lord as a remnant in this world today. That's the kind of thing when churches say that we're the only ones. That's called a cult. <laughs> and so I want to make this point as we close from the example of the story of Elijah. That God has preserved a righteous remnant around the world. We're only a small part of the larger body of Christ to reflect his righteousness on the earth. God is doing some amazing things through his church around the world. And I'm excited that we get to be a small part of it. I thank God for you. And I pray that we together will remain true to the Lord and to his word, and that we will share Jesus, reflect Jesus, and represent Jesus as part of the remnant of God's church in the world today. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this reminder from the book of Jeremiah about a remnant in that day and we pray that we would be faithful to you in such a way that your righteousness would be represented in our lives. May the church of Jesus Christ, though we might be few compared to the rest of the population, few with you, Lord, is innumerable. We pray that you would use us, Lord, that others might know the life-changing person of Jesus Christ. No matter who would receive it or believe it, that's your work, Lord. It's our work to tell them. And may we never shrink back from living the truth and standing for what is right in our day to represent your righteousness in our world. Strengthen our hearts, Lord. May we never forget that you're with us. May you use us, Lord, for your glory. And we thank you together that we might serve you well as the remnant in the earth. Come, Lord Jesus. May you find us faithful when you come again, that we can stand before you and hear you say to us, well done, good and faithful servants. We give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen.